me say the, the, the task uh, I have here, I've been assigned and one I want to fulfill is to discuss what uh, should high school students, and I would add Americans generally, know about legislatures. And when I say legislatures, I mean not only state legislatures and local legislatures, but I mean the national legislature as well. Now, <clears throat> the question is, how do you get high school students to understand legislatures? I'm not sure. Uh, I have only come to one conclusion about legislatures after watching them for my professional career, and that conclusion is, I don't understand them. Uh, I understand little bits and pieces. I probably understand them better than I did, you know, when I started out and thought I understood them or would understand them quickly. But really what I've come to more than anything else is an appreciation of legislatures. I mean, like Carl, I'm a, a legislative junkie, a legislative groupie, uh, deeply appreciated. I am biased, I admit. Um, they're not easy to appreciate because they're not pretty. And our society really puts an enormous premium on pretty. And legislatures and representative gen democracy generally is not pretty. Otto von Bismarck, the Chancellor of Germany in the late 19th century made a very famous comment, and that is there are two things you don't want to see being made. One is sausage, and the other is law. <laughs> and that comment has been repeated ad infinitum by legislators and by <coughs> observers and journalists. I wondered about that comment. Uh, it shows what tenure does for you. You can think about a comment like that instead of really putting in work. Um, and several years ago when I was in Columbus, Ohio, uh, spending a couple of weeks observing the Ohio legislature, uh, I got into the, Columb uh, the Ohio Packing Company, which was one of two uh, sausage factories in Columbus. And I got a tour uh, and spent about two hours watching sausage being made. <laughs> and it was absolutely clear that sausage making and lawmaking were poles apart. I'm not accusing Chancellor Bismarck of being a liar, but maybe sausage making had changed. There were 60 people working in the Ohio packing plant. They were working on different operations, but they were all part of one team. In the legislature, there are many teams. There's the team of R's, the team of D's, the House team, the Senate team, this standing committee team, that standing committee team. In the sausage factory, everybody on the sausage team was trying to make the best sausage possible. In the legislature, there's no agreement on what the best sausage or the best law is. <laughs> the D's don't agree with the R's. The House is in a disagreement with the Senate. The legislature and the governor don't see it exactly eye to eye. And even individuals within each of these blocks disagrees. No one tries to prevent sausage from seeing the light of day. <laughs> but you damn well want to kill a bill in committee if you can, or between one house and the other. If you are opposed to it, you don't want that bill to see the light of day. No one tries to attach a Bratwurst amendment to a Frankfurter. <laughs> I'm sure Bratwurst amendments have been attached to Frankfurters in the legislature, poison pill amendments, all sorts of amendments for different strategic purposes. 
sausage is constantly being monitored by federal authorities. It's tested for fat content, for moisture, for seasoning. All of the ingredients are uh, listed. In lawmaking, uniformity is practically unheard of, and it's very difficult to know what goes into each law. Certainly, uh, you know, it's such a uh, busy process going on in not a three-ring circus, but a hundred-ring circus. Only a few weeks elapse between the time that materials are unloaded at the shipping docks of the sausage factory to the time that sausage uh, products are loaded on the trucks and go out to distributors. In the legislature, it may take a year, two years, 10 years for a law to come out. Uh, much law takes a lot of time and gestation. So lawmaking is unique. It's not like sausage making. It is unique, it is confused, it is complicated, it is messy, it is remarkable. The question is, what do we teach about it and how do we teach about something uh, that is so difficult to grab hold of? There's so much to teach about it, how a bill becomes a law going through the committee stage, the floor stage, to the other body uh, and what have you, to conference committee, uh, about senators and representatives and, you know, how they spend their days how interest groups, you know, back or oppose legislation and how they lobby legislators. The question is, though, what is fundamental? And I would propose that there are four fundamental lessons that ought to be taught. And I would say that if people don't get these lessons, they don't really get representative democracy, except at a very general level, but they don't get representative democracy in their gut. One lesson is about representative democracy in general. And Tom Mann made the point that you've got to see legislatures in the larger context of the political system. You can't just isolate them and look at the nuts and bolts of legislatures and figure out what is going on or what should be going on. A second lesson is about representation itself, the process of representation. And that was pointed out, you know, uh, in, in, you know, in terms of the establishment of the Republic and Tony Corrado, you know, kind of mentioned that. A third lesson is about legislators themselves and what makes these people tick. And finally, the fourth lesson is about the legislature as an institution in the legislative process. Those are four lessons. And first, American democracy. We have a diverse population in our country. We have a diverse population in our states. Within each state, there is diversity. Some states are more diverse than others. Even in local communities, which may be more homogeneous than states or nation, there is diversity. The diversity of the population is reflected in a diversity of values that people have, in a diversity of opinions they have, in a diversity of preferences they have. So this diversity leads to disagreement. People disagree. Republicans disagree with Democrats. Men and women have different attitudes on particular issues. There is a gap on some issues between young and old. The religious and the non-religious see political affairs differently. Um, at a general level, we all agree that we want to improve education, we want to improve health, we want to improve transportation, we want to improve the economy. But the real question is, how do you do it? And there's certainly no agreement on, let's say, education that you're probably most familiar with. Uh, you know, some people think the way to do it is no child left behind. Some people think that no child left behind should have been left behind. Uh, and it's legitimate disagreement. 
these are complicated matters and we don't have the answers and we are constantly seeking the answers and trying to, through democratic processes, get toward answers. So there's disagreement over issues, abortion, gay rights, capital punishment, taxes, the driving age, you name it, and not everybody agrees. Well, simply stated, in a democracy, uh, people disagree with one another, and they should disagree with one another. It's legitimate, and it's quite normal. And I think it's absolutely necessary for kids to recognize that what goes on in their families and what goes on in their peer groups, the disagreements that take place about where to eat dinner or what to see at the movies or which television channel to watch, those disagreements are echoed, reflected, you know, in political chambers. The second lesson, I think, has to do with representative democracy, the nature of representation. And it was pointed out, and you know well, uh, that the framers of the US Constitution provided for a system, which was be beautifully stated by Madison in Federalist Number 10, that would refine and enlarge the public's views by passing them through a chosen body of citizens. This was a, an elite chosen or elected by citizens to represent them. People who didn't have the inclination or the time to participate in the running of government would choose those who did have the inclination and the time and, in that century, the talent to run government. So people in the nation, in the states, and in most localities for the most part, do not directly decide on policy. Rather, they choose their representatives who decide on their behalf. They make known their views to their representatives. They vote for their representatives. They lobby their representatives, but the representatives are the ones who are in the trenches really trying to sort it out and to come to some kinds of settlements. This is how representative democracy is structured. There are Variations, there is some de direct democracy that is allowed for in 24 states where they have an initiative. That is, the legislature can be bypassed and uh, the public can, can vote directly on a referendum proposition. And you've got direct democracy in some town meetings, in New England in particular, where people get together and make policy. But mainly, the representational system here relies on those who are elected to serve in legislative bodies. And generally speaking, I think you will find that these people faithfully represent their constituencies. Now, they do this for very obvious reasons. First, they believe that it is part of the representative's job to represent your constituency. Secondly, they had better do it or they will be looking for other jobs. And thirdly, they really are at one with their district. They're not aliens to their district. They're at one with their district or at least with the majority of people in their district. That is to say, Democrats tend to be elected from districts with Democratic majorities and Republicans from districts with Republican majorities. And they look primarily on some of the major issues that divide the parties, they look primarily at their majority voter support. Um, <coughs> I should mention here that people are also represented by political parties and by political interest groups to which they may or may not belong. Tom Mann mentioned that you know, we are thinking of all independent voters out there, but the fact is that you know, most voters either lean Democratic or lean Republican. There may be 15 or 20% of the total electorate that really is independent. Uh, it's no coincidence that 
of those who voted for, you know, George Bush were Republicans. And it's no coincidence that 90% of those who, you know, voted for Kerry were Democrats. Uh, people tend to vote along party lines, even in a very high visibility election, like a presidential election, where they have all sorts of information, all sorts of cues, they see the people constantly on television and debates, on blogs. In low visibility elections, which, you know, legislative elections generally are, party is the major cue. Um, as far as interest groups are concerned, well, we, we regard, or the Americans regard, you know, interest groups, special interests, as we call them derogatorily, as public enemy number one. And yet, seven out of ten Americans is a member, a card-carrying member of one interest group or another. Uh, as you are members of a education association at, you know, the national and at the state level, members of interest groups. Of course, the groups that we ourselves belong to, we don't regard as interest groups or special <laughs> interests. Because our groups, as you know, are for the public interest or for the interest of kids. It's all those other groups out there that are the special selfish interests. The fact is, that's the way we're represented. I dare say that I don't have a political opinion that isn't represented by some group out there, probably by tens of groups out there, uh, that are representing my political opinions. I may not be a member of that group, but my opinions are well represented. They may not be well formulated, but they're well represented. <laughs> Third, take the nature of legislators themselves. I think this is a lesson that people have got to uh, digest. I mean, most people are cynical about legislators. Not their own legislator. They like their own legislator. They vote to return their own legislator. If you ask public opinion polls, 70% think their own legislator is pretty good. It's the rest of those bums. I mean, term limits was an attempt by Americans to get rid of all the other legislators and keep their own. It couldn't be done that way. Um, I mean, they think legislators generally are selfish, out for themselves to promote their private interests, not the public interest. And they even think that most legislators are crooks. Now, among 7,382 members of the 50 state legislatures, I would say there are the following. Some of them are, a few are personally corrupt. A few come too close to the ethical line. Some are arrogant, some are stupid, <laughs> and some are indicted and some are convicted. <laughs> but all of those I've mentioned are very, very few, a very small percentage of the total members who serve in the legislature. But this, these few get all the ink. They're the ones that we see on television or hear about because the other legislators who are doing their jobs are just not news. That's no news, not news for any media. So <coughs> I think um, our legislators, our people in politics, they're, they're, they're not saints. Democratic politics, campaigns, Elections they don't produce saints. Saints couldn't get elected in this country <laughs> and probably shouldn't be elected in a democratic polity. But most of our legislators run for office in order to do the right thing. Now, it may not be my right thing and it may not be your right thing, but it may be the right thing of most of their constituents and it may be their personal right thing. They want to advance ideas they believe in. They want to improve education. They want to improve transportation policy or health policy. They want to help people in their constituencies, you know, with all sorts of things. 
most people who are in public service really have public regarding motivations. And most people at the state legislative level or at the congressional level make sacrifices. They certainly sacrifice family life. They sacrifice privacy. Most of them, the large majority, sacrifice income. Uh, and in today's perilous world, they sacrifice their reputations. Well, this is what they want to do. They have a choice. Nobody is forcing them to run for public office. But I think that we, and high school students are among the we, or to appreciate what they're doing and try to understand that they're not all a bunch of crooks. Fourth, the nature of the legislature uh, as an institution in the legislative process. This has got to be a lesson that is communicated. In each state or locality, let's say, you start off with individual legislators. In a state legislature, there may be 120, there may be 200, or you know, in the New Hampshire House, there are 400. Uh, you start off with the legislators. These legislators have conflicting values, interests, and priorities. And you add to this mix the fact that these legislators represent constituents who have different and conflicting values, interests, and priorities. And you spice it all up with partisan conflict, which both reflects and contributes to public differences. And you lay on top of all of this the element of accountability, which is enforced by the requirement that legislators every two or four years have to run for re-election. Well, this is the environment in which each legislator tries to promote an agenda in which he or she believes, and in which the legislature tries, by majority rule or greater consensus, to reach settlements on issues. Now, just about anything can make it to the legislature's agenda. Not everything can make it into law. And reaching an agreement requires a process of study, of deliberation, deliberation over substantive merits, over political merits, or demerits on policy proposals. It requires negotiation. It requires strategizing. It requires usually compromise, all in order to get the necessary votes, the majority votes that are needed at successive stages of the process to get a bill to becoming a law. And often it's compromise, which makes the difference uh, in one way or another. And compromise, I think, has been a critical element of democratic politics, you know, starting with the great compromise in the Constitutional Convention, which brought us two houses and the representational system we have. Well, this is what all of this, the deliberation, study, negotiation, the back and forth that takes place in the Senate, in the House, and standing committees and party caucuses on the floor, and then between the legislature and the executive. It goes on over broad policy. It goes on over provisions of policy. It goes on over the narrowest details. Because details are important. Details can you know, make or break whether something works. People disagree over details. Well, let me conclude by saying uh, the legislative process, unlike sausage making today, is not at all pretty. I found sausage making to be pretty. <laughs> it doesn't look good. And it is difficult to appreciate. Some years ago, I was looking at a New Jersey series of polls that we took at the Eagleton Institute of Politics in New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. If you can't tell, I wear this tie with the, uh, this is not a mustard stain on the tie. <laughs> it's the state of New Jersey. Uh, the state is bigger, but it couldn't fit on the tie. <laughs> I was looking at polls that we had taken on a quarterly basis to see, you know, whether there were any patterns in public approval of the legislature and the question that was asked, what kind of job do, is the legislature doing? Excellent, good, 
only fair or poor. And I looked at about 10 years worth of these approval questions to see what the, whether there was a pattern. And I only found one pattern. And the one pattern was that the approval ratings were really low. Uh, surprise. But in July and August, they went up. And then they'd go down again in September. And then they'd go up in July and August. Why? Well, because the legislature wasn't there in July and August. <laughs> the legislature looks best when it isn't doing its job. Because its job is messy. Its job is resolving conflict. Its job is trying to build majorities. Its job is debating, deliberating, and what have you. So it is a job that will never look good, difficult to appreciate. But I think legislatures do what they're supposed to do in a representative democracy. They certainly provide access to people and groups. They certainly represent constituencies and constituents. And the legislature engages in study and deliberation and negotiations. And it usually arrives at a settlement, not a solution, a settlement, because nothing is forever and everything is open at the next session. I would say the legislature is not only a means to an end, and not even primarily a means to an end, the end being health policy or tax policy or prosperity for citizens. I would say that the legislature is an end itself because it provides a process by which we settle disagreements and values, interests, and, pri and, and preferences, and we do it by a democratic means. The legislature and the process are what are most important, not any particular policy outcome. I mean, I may be bleary-eyed from all these years of watching state legislatures, but I think they work. Uh, I think they work remarkably well, but by no means perfect. I think they can work better, and they probably should be working better. The question is, how do we get them to work better? And on that, I assure you, we will all disagree. <laughs> Thank you.